Today's story is on Andrew Brannan, who was the first person executed in 2015 for the murder of Lawrence County Deputy Sheriff Kyle Wayne Dinkeller. Andrew Brannan was born on November 26, 1948, in Georgia. He was the middle child of three boys, and he grew up on a farm where three generations of Brannans had lived. His parents, Esther and Bob, were married and did their best to make sure their children grew up with respect and good morals. When Andrew's father, Bob, graduated from high school, he joined the National Guard and fought in two wars before retiring in the mid-1960s. He was a war hero and wanted his sons to follow in his footsteps. After retiring from the Army, he went back to college to earn a degree and became a middle school principal. He was very well respected in his community and his wife supported him throughout the years. When Bob was away at war, the three Brannan boys were sent to military schools that were far away from home in the hopes of them growing up to be honorable men in society. Unfortunately, things did not go as planned, and one by one, things started to go downhill for the family. Andrew's eldest brother, Bobby, dropped out of college in order to fight in the Vietnam War and became a helicopter gunner. He was injured after surviving a crash, received a Purple Heart, and eventually settled down, married, and had three children. He passed away at the young age of 32 while crashing an aircraft that was just a mile shy of landing. Andrew's younger brother Sam graduated high school, but immediately after graduation joined the Vietnam War just like his brothers. By the time the war was over, Sam was honorably discharged. He married, but his wife soon filed for divorce and his mental health came crashing down. He fell into a deep depression and began to heavily drink. He lost his job, he lost his wife, and felt that he had no control, so he made the decision to end his life at the age of 31 by sitting in a car and succumbing to the exhaust fumes. As for Andrew, he was opposite of his brothers growing up and was more of a shy and reserved type of person. He considered himself to be more of a nerd and not as attractive as his brothers. After graduating high school in 1967, he attended West Georgia College and majored in history. He completed one year of college before deciding to drop out and enlist in the army to fight in the Vietnam War along with his older brother. While fighting, he specialized as an artillery officer and although he had to keep it together and portray to be strong, inside he was struggling because he had witnessed so many people die. One of his friends and fellow officers died near him after stepping on a landmine and his commander was killed as well. He was later sent to LZ Dotty, which was a 1st Battalion base for the 6th Infantry. It was Andrew's battalion that had killed over 500 innocent civilians that was compromised of mainly women and children, so they were dubbed baby killers. After that massacre, Andrew wrote letters home to his parents saying that he was not in a good place and that it was very dangerous where he was. At one point, his physical health also declined and he wrote home that he felt that he had dysentery and that they did have a good medic, but the medic was hit by a landmine. He had recounted distinctly being able to recognize the smell of burning flesh, seeing fellow soldiers injured and disfigured from mines or shrapnel and screaming in pain around him. After seven years in the army, Andrew was sent to the army reserves before being honorably discharged in 1975. Like his father, he received awards for his service and received a Bronze Star and two Army Commendation Medals. He had no issues while fighting under horrible conditions and fellow servicemen spoke very highly of him. A year before being discharged, that's when his younger brother Sam deployed to fight in the Vietnam War in 1974. The same year Andrew was discharged from the Army is when his older brother Bobby passed away, but it was also the same year he got married. The relationship was far from perfect, and the recent loss of his brother, along with the effects of the war, had changed him, and he was suffering from PTSD, which he felt caused him to be abusive and angry with and around his wife. Andrew's wife was not happy, so after six years of marriage, their divorce was finalized in 1981. 
Andrew's younger brother had passed away and his father passed away in 1993 from prostate cancer. A year after the death of his father, Andrew was diagnosed with depression and bipolar disorder by the Department of Veterans Affairs, who in turn declared him to be fully disabled. He had been hospitalized twice because of his mental health as well. Four years after his diagnosis, he would still experience flashbacks and his mental health continued to decline because he would go off of his medication. He was living alone in Lawrence County and only had his mother for support. The home was built by Andrew in the woods, far away from others. One day on January 12, 1998, Andrew drove to his mother's house in Stockbridge, Georgia to spend some time with her, and by the time afternoon rolled around, he decided to leave and head back home. He was on Interstate 16 when Deputy Sheriff Kyle Dinkeller saw that Andrew was driving about 98 miles per hour on his radar gun. Not pulling over right away, Andrew exited the freeway onto Whipple Crossing Road in a rural area, and Deputy Kyle, who was equipped with a microphone on his persons, decided to turn on his dash cam. He then stopped approximately 20 feet behind Andrew, and this event occurred. Driver, step back here to me. Come on back here for me. Come on back. How you doing today? Good. Come on back here. Keep your hands out of your pocket. Keep your hands out of your pocket, sir. Sir. Come here. Sir, come here. 37 Radio 1078. Come here, sir. Sir, get back. What are you calling, Sir, get back. Now, get back. Get back. Sir, get back now. No. Get back. Fuck you. Sir, get back. No. I'm telling you now. Get back, sir. Sir, get back. Sir, I am a goddamn Vietnam combat veteran. Step back. And I am not. Sir, fuck you. Sir, step back now. Get back. Get back. Get back now. 1078, radio 1018. Sir, step back now. Sir, get back now. 16. Sir, get back! Get out of the car now! Sir, get out of the car! I will do my life! Get back here now! Get to your vehicle! Put the gun down! Well, I got him down the gun! I need help! Put the gun down! Put it down now! Put the gun down! Drop the gun now! Due to the sounds and the graphic nature of the video, I was not able to show the whole video, but you will be able to find it if you search on YouTube. From that encounter, Deputy Kyle was only able to shoot Andrew once in the stomach, and Andrew was able to shoot Deputy Kyle nine times. Most of the shots were in his arms and legs, and the fatal shot was to Deputy Kyle's eye, and it came after Andrew was aware that Deputy Kyle was unconscious. Initially, when Deputy Kyle fired, they were warning shots, so by the time he was in danger and needed to shoot Andrew to protect himself, he had to reload, which cost him the necessary time that he needed. Andrew eventually fled the scene, and when cops got a warrant to search his home, he wasn't there because he was hiding in the woods. They did, however, find two rifles hanging on his wall, with one being the murder weapon. Next to his house was Andrew's white truck that had bullet holes in it and was later seized for evidence. Along with the gun and car that was used during the incident, police also found bloodstains, ammunition, shell casings, and weed. Andrew was soon arrested and he was indicted on malice murder on April 7, 1998. The state of Georgia then filed a motion that they would be seeking the death penalty on April 30th, 1998. The actual trial began on January 18th and ended on January 30th, 2000. The jury found Andrew guilty of malice murder and he was sentenced to death by method of lethal injection. Andrew tried to file for a new trial, but it was denied on July 2nd, 2001. His appeals were also denied 
with one point being that his truck was not able to be inspected because the towing company that took his car gave it to the lien holder and it was eventually repaired and sold to somebody else. In the document's own words, it stated that he had filed a motion to preserve, inspect, and examine all of the evidence related to the crime before the trial, but his wishes were not granted. Other points made was that the court was not made aware that he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and PTSD and that he was declared 100% disabled. His time in war and effects of the war were also not talked about. While being able to take medication in prison, his mental health did get better, but he was caught with a handmade razor weapon, so they said that his violent behavior had not changed. The efforts to get Andrew's death sentence commuted failed because the Georgia Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court failed to intervene. After 17 years on death row, Andrew was set to be executed on January 13, 2015. He was being held at the Georgia Diagnostic and Classification State Prison, and for his last meal, he had three eggs over easy, biscuits and gravy, sausage, hash browns, pecan waffles with strawberries, milk, apple juice, and decaf coffee. For his final words, he said, I extend my condolences to the Dinkeller family, especially Kyle's parents and his wife and his two children. I feel like my status was slow torture for the last 15 years. I had to say that with them here. I have to tell the truth. I am certainly glad to be leaving. He then prayed with a pastor and was pronounced dead at 8.33 p.m. Deputy Sheriff Kyle was married to his wife Angela and they had two children together with one on the way before his death. Their son was born eight months after Kyle passed away. Thank you for watching and now for discussion and question time. Being that there's actual video evidence of the actual crime and there's no argument as to whether or not he's the killer, do you think that it was smart for the attorneys to try and argue anything about the evidence, for example, like them not being able to examine the car? I don't think that's relevant. If they are trying to get his sentence commuted to life in prison, I think the smartest thing to do would be to focus on the fact that he's now on medication and um, how they did not present anything in court about his PTSD or his bipolar disorder. So let me know what you guys think. What are your thoughts on Deputy Kyle emptying his clip off in the air before aiming at Andrew? He had to reload before he even tried to aim at Andrew, and in the video, he had yelled that he was in fear of his life while instructing him to put down the gun. I have watched other speeding stops from this officer, and he had allowed suspects to walk behind him freely and did not seem cautious at all. He absolutely did not deserve to die, but it did make me think of how some people are shot and killed while they have absolutely no weapon on them. But someone like Andrew, who was clearly not all the way there mentally that day, was able to run up to Deputy Kyle, cuss him out, run back to his car, shout more obscenities while holding his rifle, and was able to get shots out. And even with those shots, Deputy Kyle still did not shoot at Andrew. They were warning shots. Why do you think that is? Hello everyone and welcome to the 63rd episode of Death Row Executions. Today's story is on America's first police officer to be sentenced to death. In 1855, with Castle Gardens in New York becoming the first official immigrant receiving station, many Europeans were settling in America and having children that would be first generation Americans. Over the next few decades, over 8 million immigrants from Europe had made the big move, which included the parents of Charles Becker, who emigrated from Germany. The move was made a little easy with the help of the U.S. government, who assisted many families and offered boarding houses and labor exchange programs. Finally, on July 26, 1870, Charles Becker was born in Sullivan County, New York. He was child number six out of 10 children altogether, and growing up, not only was becoming a police officer enticing, but the street life was as well. He was known for being bigger than the average guy, with hands so big 
it was said that they looked like hammers. At the age of 20, he moved away from his family to New York City in the hopes of making money and got his first job working as a baker. The baker job did not last long and he soon started a new job as a bouncer at a German bar. Three years later, in November of 1893, Charles met corrupt politician Big Time Sullivan. Big Time Sullivan was in charge at Tammany Hall and he let Charles know that he could get him in the police force if he had the right kind of money. Charles saved $250, which was a third of the annual salary he would be making, and after giving it to Big Time Sullivan, Charles was now an official police officer with the New York City Police Department. The new uniform did not change who Charles was as a person, and he quickly became known as a crooked cop. He was a highly intelligent man, but instead of using his brain, he would use his brawn. He had a fixation on prostitutes and would often beat them up and take their money without any repercussions. At most, all he would get was a slap on the wrist. Now, 1896, three years after he joined the force, Charles spotted a prostitute by the name of Ruby Young. She was walking on Broadway with famous author Stephen Crane and two choir girls. Charles came up to Ruby, physically assaulted her, and then arrested her for soliciting sex. Upset by the false accusation, Stephen attended Ruby's hearing, which was the day after she was arrested. He testified on Ruby's behalf, and the judge presiding over the case had the case dismissed. Due to Stephen's popularity and the scandal around what happened, media was all over the case, and Stephen was quoted saying to reporters, if the girl will have the officer prosecuted for perjury, I will gladly support her. A month after the case was dismissed, Stephen was unable to let go of his anger towards Charles, so he formally filed charges against him. The trial for Charles began on October 15, 1896, and this is when he gained confidence and learned that with his badge, he would be able to get away with anything. In the months leading up to his trial, the New York City Police Commissioner at the time was none other than Theodore Roosevelt, and not only did he support Charles, making it known that he believed Charles was acting as a professional policeman, but he reprimanded Stephen for testifying on behalf of a prostitute. Charles knew he lied under oath against Ruby Young, but for his trial, he was surrounded and supported by many powerful men within the police force. 18th President of the United States, Ulysses S. Grant, had a son by the name of Frederick Dent Grant, who was commissioner along with Theodore Roosevelt and head of the trial. After five hours, Charles Becker was acquitted. Charles was happy, loving life, and married a woman by the name of Mary Becker, but she died from tuberculosis about eight months after they married. He quickly moved on and married a Canadian woman by the name of Letitia Stenson, and the two had their son, Howard Becker, who was born in 1899. In 1904, the couple divorced and Letitia married a brother of Charles and moved west, taking Howard with her. Not phased by the split, Charles met a new woman by the name of Helen Becker, and they soon married. His wife was an honest woman working as a school teacher, and she was blind to how corrupt her husband really was. Charles was working in an area where there were street gangs, theaters, brothels, gambling dens, and hotels. The streets were busy, and policemen in the area were known for being easily bribed. Charles's superiors were making more money than him on bribes, but this soon changed when he was promoted to sergeant in 1907, two years after he married Helen. Instead of obsessing over hookers, he became a bagman for his police chief, Captain Max Schmidtberger, in the area of Tenderloin. Charles was assigned the task of collecting dirty money from the brothels and gambling clubs, giving it to Captain Max, and for this, Charles would get a 10% cut. By 1911, Captain Max got busted and the force was unable to protect him, so he was relieved from his job and charged with corruption. Charles took his position 
and took control of every dirty business in the Tenderloin area. One of the most popular gangs of the underworld during that time in that area was the Eastman Gang. The founder of the Eastman Gang, Monk Eastman, was locked up in prison, so a man by the name of Jack Zellick took control and became the new leader of the gang. His relationship with Charles grew, and Charles had designated Jack to be his hitman and his muscle for putting people in line who gave Charles any issues. Over a very short period of time, Charles was able to extort over $100,000 from all of the businesses in town. To keep people on his side, Charles would share this money with other policemen and politicians. One man Charles was frequently getting money from was Herman Rosenthal. Herman was a bookie who owned multiple illegal casinos, with one of them being the fancy three-story Hesper Club. Herman was tired of handing out money to Charles and decided enough was enough. One day, he refused to pay, and instead of having his goons beat Herman up, Charles took a visit to the club himself. Once inside, he pushed Herman into a wall, and according to Annals of Crime, Charles said, I fix payoffs in New York. You either pay me or die. On another day, Charles ordered a police raid at one of Herman's clubs and the policemen left a significant amount of damage. Instead of backing down and giving in, Herman decided to fight and made an official complaint against Charles Becker. Herman went to anyone who would listen, including the press, letting them know that Charles was a crooked cop who collected 20% of everything his casinos made. By July of 1912, Charles was printed in the New York World newspaper, along with two other senior police officials, about extorting money from Herman. When Charles got wind of the chaos Herman was causing, he spoke to gang member Jack Zellig and told him he wanted Herman croaked. Trial began, and Herman was supposed to testify in court in front of a grand jury on July 16, 1912. In order to prevent Herman from testifying, Jack spoke with two gamblers, Bald Jack Rose and Harry Vallon, and they told him that Herman would be at the Hotel Metropole off Times Square. Lefty Louie, Whitey Lewis, Dago Frank, and Jip the Blood drove to the hotel and it was around two o'clock in the morning. They were waiting in their car and as Herman was walking out of the hotel, one of the thugs yelled out, over here Herman, it was pretty dark, and Herman was unable to identify the voice or see who had called him, so he replied by shouting out, Who's that? He stepped out into the street and was immediately met with five bullets that hit his neck, nose, and head. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Soon to be governor of New York, Charles S. Whitman, who was acting as district attorney, made it known that Herman was killed under Charles Becker's request. Citizens of New York City spoke up and out against Charles, so the force was pressured to strip him of his title and he was assigned desk duty in the Bronx. A day after the murder, the men who killed Herman went out to enjoy the day, and here is a picture of them on that day after they had a picnic. Charles thought he was off the hook for the murder but unbeknownst to him, Charles Whitman and his colleagues continued to investigate the murder. On July 29, 1912, Charles was finally arrested at his job. The judge presiding over the trial was Judge John Goff, and he had ill feelings towards Charles Becker. Many felt that he was biased, and he ultimately convicted Charles of first-degree murder and sentenced him to death. Charles tried his best to have a different outcome and even went as far as to ordering the murder of Jack Zellig, the Eastman gang leader who formed the small crew to kill Herman. Despite Jack being dead and unable to testify against Charles Becker, it did not change the outcome of the first trial. Charles did appeal his case and it was overturned due to the fact that they indeed did believe that Judge Goff was biased 
and there was no evidence to prove that Charles was involved in murdering Herman. The court ordered a retrial, and while he was awaiting trial, he and his wife Helen had a baby girl named Charlotte Becker, who was born in 1913, but she died less than 24 hours after she was born. That same year, the men who killed Herman were separately tried and convicted, and were all executed on April 14, 1913. The following year, in 1914, the retrial began. Charles went on stand and in his own words said, Sure, I told them to put Rosenthal out of the way, but I didn't mean they should kill him. I wanted them to get him out of town so he wouldn't blab. Killing him was Rose's idea and the others. They wanted to save their own skins. With a new judge and jury, Charles Becker was convicted of murder on May 22, 1914, and it was the first reconviction in the city's history. Charles was emotionless then and again on July 16, 1914, when he received his sentence of death. He had filed many appeals, which were all denied, and his last hope was to get a pardon from the governor himself. This also made history because it was the first time a district attorney had become a governor and had the power to pardon a criminal he prosecuted. This man was none other than the district attorney, Charles Whitman, and in November of 1914, he had become governor of New York. Pleading to him was also Helen Becker. She met with him personally and cried to him while expressing herself. Governor, I know Charlie is no saint, but he is not the foul murderer he has been branded. Charles Whitman shook his head no and replied by telling her, I want you to feel free to tell me everything. If there is anything that you know that you think would help your husband or that I should know, you may tell it to me with the fullest assurance that it will be absolutely confidential. Helen then replied by telling him there was nothing to tell with no new evidence to prove his innocence, Charles Becker was not given a pardon by Governor Whitman. Governor Whitman was not persuaded by Becker's supporters, nor was he moved by Becker's final letter to him that read, I am innocent as you of having murdered Herman Rosenthal, or having counseled, procured, or aided his murder, or having any knowledge of that dreadful crime. The execution of Charles Becker was set for July 30th, 1915 at the Sing Sing Prison in New York. The night before his execution, prison officials said he ate normal prison dinner and his appetite was not affected. He was given a cigar to smoke and the prison officials noticed how calm he appeared and Charles responded by saying, what can I do? I've got to face it, haven't I? It was 5.30 a.m. on July 30, 1915, and Charles walked to the execution room unrestrained. He was strapped into the electric chair, and for his last words he said, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. After he was done speaking, it was time, and he was shocked with 2,000 volts. Officials underestimated the voltage and Charles's strength, so after the first botched shock, Charles was still alive. He was shocked for a second time, but it was still too low to have completed the job. Reporters and witnesses were dismayed, with a few even fainting because they were unable to stomach what they were witnessing. More prison officials were called in to assist, his straps were tightened, and the voltage was increased yet again. For them, the third time was the charm because it finally worked after nine minutes of struggles and failed attempts. Charles was buried at the Woodlawn Cemetery next to his baby girl who passed away, and angered by her husband not being pardoned, Helen had a nameplate made for her husband's coffin that read, Murdered by Governor Whitman. Over 5,000 people convened at the Becker House, which included many people from the police force, and they had the nameplate removed before Charles was officially buried. Hello everyone, so a while ago I told the story of Charles Becker, 
who was the first American police officer sentenced to death and executed in America. Today's story is on Len Davis. He was also a former corrupt police officer, and he is currently on death row. Len Davis was born on August 6th, 1964. As an adult, he decided to become a police officer for the New Orleans Police Department. His track record as a police officer was far from stellar. There was a lot of crime in New Orleans, and instead of there being a group of upstanding police officers, majority of the officers within the NLPD during that time were corrupt just like Len. Len was given the nickname RoboCop by the community because of his size and aggressive nature towards people. Between the years of 1987 and 1992, he was suspended six times and over 20 people had filed complaints against him. Despite the bad track record, he was still awarded a Medal of Merit in 1993. Not only was the community aware of the corruption within the police department, but the FBI was as well, and they decided to do something about it starting in 1994. The FBI placed undercover civilians and officers in the city for their sting, Operation Shattered Shield, and they found out that Len was extorting protection money from a drug dealer who also happened to be an FBI informant. They also wanted to solicit NLPD officers to guard a warehouse holding illegal drugs for shipment. The FBI sting abruptly came to an end on October 13, 1994, because an innocent woman by the name of Kim Groves was murdered and Len was behind it all. Jasmine Groves, who was the daughter of Kim Groves, penned a letter to the public a couple of years ago. My name is Jasmine Groves and I am the youngest of three children of Kim Marie Groves. A former New Orleans police officer, Len Davis put a hit on my mother in retaliation for her witnessing him beat a teenager in our neighborhood and filing a complaint against him. The day my mother reported Officer Davis was the day before my 13th birthday. About 3.30 p.m., she called the office to file the complaint and it usually took 24 to 72 hours for an officer to be notified of a complaint against them. Unfortunately, Davis knew within hours of my mother filing the complaint. By the time she made it home that night, the hit to take her life was already set. Because it was the night before my birthday, my mom was planning my party. My cousin and I were having a sleepover and we were playing cards. My mom came into the room and started singing the happy birthday song. I smiled the whole time she sang because she always made me feel special. For some crazy reason, it felt like she knew she would not get to wish me a happy birthday the next day. After she walked out of the door, within seconds, the phone rang. I was always the one to run to answer it, but that time I wish I hadn't. As I said hello, all I heard was a woman's voice screaming into the phone, Kim has just been shot and I think she's dead. At that moment, my heart stopped. I was stiff. I could not think. I could not talk. I was stuck. I was wishing she'd say she had it wrong. It was a mistake. I dropped the phone and ran screaming to my family. As we all ran out of the door, we saw my mother's body lying in the street, lifeless. As I dialed 911 for help, it took them forever. The next day, I still pushed myself to go to school, even though that didn't last long. I tried to still face life as normally as I could, but nothing was normal about my life anymore. Only a few months later did I learn that the same people I called to help save my mother were the ones who killed my mother. I lost all trust in the police. I remember that to protect and serve was always on NOPD's police cars, and now it's not anymore. I take it as a sign of them no longer protecting and serving. 26 years later after my mother's murder, my mother's murderer still appeals a sentence. Police corruption has gotten so bad that it seems like it's normal and that is the sad truth. I feel it's injustice where justice is delayed and denied. My mother died because she stood up for her civil rights and the young people in the lower ninth ward. Taking a stand should not mean taking a death sentence. In order to stop these corrupted cop killings, we need more police to love their job and take a stand with the people. Our voice must become one. I truly believe that citizens and police officers must trust each other instead of working against each other. Without this happening, all I see is failure and chaos. We cannot have police feeling that they are above the law. Just as police cars have to protect and serve, that should also be reflected in their policies. On October 10, 1994, Len was out with his partner, Sammy Williams. Kim Groves witnessed the two officers harass and hit her play nephew, Nathan Norwood, because they believed he was a suspect in a police officer's shooting. Kim then filed a complaint within the next couple of days after the assault to NOPD's Internal Affairs Office. Lynn 
learned about the complaint on October 12th. As mentioned earlier, Len had been extorting protection money from drug dealers in the area. Two of these dealers were Paul Hardy and Damon Causey. The men would often do favors for Len in exchange for protection, and the last favor he was able to request was for them to kill Kim Groves. It was now around 5 o'clock on October 13th, and Len paged for Paul. Paul called Len, and they went over the plans to kill Kim. Paul was to be the designated shooter, while Len and Damon were tasked with cleaning up any evidence. They also planned what would happen after the murder. Len was supposed to meet Paul and Damon at the police station to view photos of homicide cases. Len and Damon met up. They drove around in Len's patrol car searching for Kim in the neighborhood. At around 7.30 that night, they picked Paul up and drove back to Kim's neighborhood and let Paul out so he could walk around and find her. Lynn then left the neighborhood again to take Paul home because they were having a hard time finding Kim. Lynn then drove around with his partner Samuel, but hours had gone by and still no Kim. Lynn ended up calling Paul complaining, but Paul reassured him that the job would get done. Finally, at around 10 o'clock p.m., Lynn and his partner spotted Kim near her home, so he immediately paged Paul. After calling Lynn back, Paul made his way to Kim's neighborhood. Samuel's shift was over, so by this time, he left Len alone in the patrol car. At around 10.45, Kim was still not dead, so he called Paul to complain once again. He described what Kim was wearing and how she looked in detail. At 11 o'clock, Paul found Kim and fatally shot her. Len was unaware of the FBI being on his trail, so they quickly found out he was behind the murder of Kim Groves. The FBI also busted nine other police officers employed with the NOPD as being corrupt officers and they were relieved of their duties. In December 1994, the government filed a federal indictment against Len, Paul, and Damon. All three men were tried together in front of a jury. In July 1995, the government filed two notices of intent to seek the death penalty for Paul and Len. In August 1995, the men were charged with conspiracy to deprive Kim of her civil rights while acting under color of state law, depriving Kim of her civil rights by use of excessive force by shooting her with a firearm resulting in death, and willfully killing Kim to prevent her communications to a law enforcement officer regarding a possible federal crime. On April 26, 1996, Lynn was sentenced to death, Paul was also sentenced to death, and Damon was sentenced to life in prison after he rejected a plea deal that would have given him six to nine years in prison. After Len was sentenced, he left the courtroom and refused to return. The Fifth Circuit reversed Len and Paul's death sentence when the conviction for witness tampering was overturned. After a new sentencing hearing, the new jury agreed with sentencing Len to death on October 27, 2006. Paul was also resentenced to death, but in 2011, his sentence was commuted to life when the judge found him to be mentally retarded. As of today, Len is currently on federal death row and is imprisoned at the U.S. Penitentiary Terre Haute in Indiana. Martin Edward Grossman was born on January 19, 1965. He was raised in Pasco County, Florida as an only child in a devout Jewish home with two loving parents. His mother, Myra, suffered from mental illnesses which required her to be on prescription medication. Unfortunately, the illnesses were debilitating enough to where she was unable to care for the home, and that left Martin to grow up very fast and handle things on his own. He was doing well in school, but academics were hard to keep up with because his father grew sick and also happened to suffer from mental illnesses. He became his parents' primary caretaker at a very young age. Myra later made a statement that Martin did not finish middle school, but some accounts say that he graduated middle school and dropped out in the ninth grade. Soon after dropping out, when Martin was just 15 years old, his father passed away. The man he spent every day taking care of was now gone, and it caused him to spiral into a depression. After losing his father, he lost his grandfather, a close uncle, and then another relative, and he was no longer able to handle feeling and living life sober. He started using drugs and had easy access to prescription pills because they were pills his mother was taking. Despite him stealing and his new drug habit, his relationship with his mother did not falter and she mentioned that he always remained respectful to her. She did try and encourage him not to smoke weed, but he continued to do so behind her back. Martin began hanging around the wrong crowds and got into burglarizing different establishments. He got caught 
and spent time in prison as a young teen, but was released and put on probation. While on probation, he continued to violate rules by using drugs and continued to burglarize homes. On one hit, he was able to steal a handgun and kept it with him at all times. Now 19 years old and still on probation, Martin left his mother's home in Pasco County and met up with his 17-year-old friend Thane Taylor in Pinellas County. It was the evening of December 13, 1984, and Martin thought it would be fun to get high with his friend and shoot around in the woods. The teens thought they were alone, but in the area was a 26-year-old wildlife officer, Margaret Peggy Park, who was in her vehicle patrolling the area. When she drove up to the boys, she put the car in park, put her hazard lights on, and walked to where the boys were standing. She asked for her identification and noticed Martin's weapon, and when instructed to give her the gun, Martin followed commands. He handed Peggy his driver's license and his handgun with no issues, and he believed Peggy would let him off the hook. Martin expressed that he was sorry and begged Peggy not to turn him in because he was on probation and he did not want to go back to prison. Ignoring Martin's pleas, Peggy walked back to her patrol car and picked up her radio microphone in an attempt to reach the sheriff's office. In a panic, Martin, who was 6'4", 220 pounds at the time, grabbed Peggy's flashlight, overpowered her tiny 5'4 frame, and began hitting her over the head and body repeatedly. The more he hit her, the more she was able to force herself inside the vehicle. She was able to grab hold of her radio microphone again and scream to the sheriff's office, I'm hit. Martin became more anxious and asked his friend Thane to help him. Thane began hitting Peggy as well, but she managed to pull out her gun. Instead of firing at the teens assaulting her, she let out a warning shot and was able to get Thane from continuing on with his attack by kicking him in the private area. Adrenaline rushing, Martin was able to overpower a terrified Peggy by grabbing her gun right from her hands. The force of his grab was so hard that he broke Peggy's fingers. Martin then shot Peggy in the head, killing her instantly. The bullet went through her head and landed in a cup that was in the center console of her vehicle. Before Martin and Thane left the scene of the crime, they grabbed Martin's gun that was initially confiscated along with Peggy's weapon and Martin's driver's license. The boys then left in Martin's van and then made it to Martin's house. They invited a friend over by the name of Brian Hancock and he later said that one of the first things they told him was that they were never going to get high again. They were covered in blood and told Brian everything they had just done. Brian helped Thane hide two handguns and Martin tried to burn his shoes and clothing. He was unable to get everything to burn, so he thought it would be best to throw all of the clothes into a nearby lake. Martin then went a step further and tried to deep clean his van and changed out all four of his tires. He and Thane were still not considered suspects and a week had already passed. They opened up to another friend by the name of Brian Allen on what they had done. 11 days after Peggy was murdered, Brian Hancock, who had previously helped Thane bury the weapons used in the murder, grew anxious and ended up confessing what he had been told and what he did to the police. Thane was later apprehended and confessed everything to the police, and Martin was later arrested as well. While being held in jail, Martin confessed to other inmates that he had committed murder, and one of those men was Charles Brewer, who ended up testifying against Martin for time off of his sentence. Thane and Martin were tried together. Thane was charged with third-degree murder and Martin was charged with first-degree murder. Testifying against Martin was Charles Brewer, Brian Hancock, and Brian Allen. Martin had confessed to all three men and they made it seem like it was easy for Martin to kill and he was not remorseful about what he had done. Along with these testimonies, evidence was also introduced by the state by showing the court the burnt shoes two handguns, and fingerprints on Peggy's vehicle that belonged to both men. There was also a witness Martin was unaware of that saw him burning his articles of clothing. Testifying in support of Martin were two correctional officers who talked about his good behavior while being locked up, a childhood friend by the name of Stephen Marticus, 
and his mother, Myra, who testified that her son struggled growing up and had not even completed school. These testimonies did not help his case, and he was ultimately found guilty of first-degree murder. Thane was also found guilty of third-degree murder, but since it was a non-capital offense, a death sentence was not on the table. The jury came back with a vote of 12 to 0, and they sentenced Martin to death on December 13, 1985. They felt that him killing Peggy was considered wicked, evil, atrocious, and or cruel. The trial judge had also explained to the jury that the crime was a premeditated felony murder because when Martin escaped, he also committed a robbery or burglary by stealing Peggy's gun and taking his license back. Martin did try to appeal his sentence multiple times and requested a retrial because he felt his legal team did not do a good job representing him. One lawyer said they did a very poor and ineffective job Another lawyer said he was hired two weeks before trial began and he should have communicated with the trial judge that they needed more time to prepare. A federal judge denied the appeal and request for a retrial, saying that their statements were only made in hindsight and in the moment they felt as if they were doing a fine job. Five years after Martin was sentenced to death, inmate Charles Brewer signed an affidavit that retracted his testimony during trial. He claimed that he thought he would be getting a lesser sentence and that authorities gave him a list of questions to ask in order to get a confession from Martin. A judge denied overturning Martin's sentence on the grounds of Charles retracting his testimony because he said there was no evidence to prove that the court knew Charles was lying at the time of trial. Martin spent 25 years on death row and when it was nearing his execution date, Many people learned of who Martin Grossman was and fought to get him taken off of death row. There were over 33,000 signatures signed for a petition to get him taken off of death row, and Governor Charlie Crist received many calls and emails about Martin's case. There were also over 100 rabbis who signed petitions saying that Martin deserved a 60-day stay of execution because they believed the murder was not premeditated and that Martin was high and not in the right frame of mind. The Vatican had reached out to the governor, and Pope Benedict XVI had also heard about Martin's case. They believed Martin had since repented, was a changed man who followed the path of God, and deserved a second chance. One member of the Yeshiva world wrote, Dear Governor Christ, I am writing to implore you to consider commuting the impending execution of Martin Grossman to life in prison without parole. Although I am somewhat conservative politically and a supporter of the death penalty as punishment for certain crimes, I believe that this case may warrant clemency. The details of the actual crime committed, the murder of a young police officer in the line of duty, are horrific. In ordinary circumstances, I would be in full agreement with the imposition of the death penalty for such a crime. This case has two factors that I request be considered in sparing Martin Grossman from the death penalty, his age at the time of the crime, and his mental status. Point number one, a 19-year-old is not fully capable of adult decision-making. States recognize this in imposing a 21-year age limit on the purchase of alcohol. As a member of the Jewish community, I had to ask myself if I'm being honest in requesting clemency due to Martin Grossman's age or simply due to appeals I read in community publications. I am comfortable saying that this belief that 19 is too young to face the death penalty has nothing to do with who Martin is. Many years ago, when actor Bill Cosby's son was tragically murdered, my initial thought was, I hope the killer is caught and executed. Once the murderer was captured, and it turned out he was 19 years old, I no longer thought he should face the death penalty. He was too young. Point number two, a teenager, a young adult, with an IQ of 77 is not a normal functioning person. While he may survive in society with a menial job, he lacks the intelligence and thinking skills most of us enjoy in our day-to-day -day lives. He is capable enough to know right from wrong and he does deserve to be punished for his terrible crime. Nonetheless, 
His significantly reduced mental capacity should be a reason to spare him from the most severe punishment society has to offer. Allowing a borderline retarded person to be executed would be a blot on the state that permitted it. This is not a request for forgiveness. This is not minimizing the horrible crime and the tragedy of a young police officer's life cut short. This is a request that Martin Grossman be given the next most severe punishment allowed by law, life without parole, instead of execution. Thank you for your time and consideration, Governor. Despite Governor Christ receiving so many letters, it never swayed his beliefs. It was he who reinstated the death penalty in Florida in the year 2008, and many pro-death penalty knew he would not change his mind. For Execution Day, February 16, 2010, at the Florida State Prison, Martin was offered a last meal but refused to order anything and decided to purchase food from the canteen instead. He bought a chicken sandwich, banana cream cookies, peanut butter cookies, and a can of fruit punch. A spokesperson for the prison said that he finished everything. After being strapped in for his lethal injection execution, Martin gave his final words. I fully regret everything that occurred that night for everything that was done, whether I remember it or not. In attendance of the execution was the victim's sister, mother, and brother. In a statement from Peggy's sister, Betsy, we came here today hoping for closure and an end to the years of reminders of how Peggy died, overshadowing the memories of how she lived. I believe we realize that hope today. After Martin's last words to everyone, he recited a Jewish prayer to himself, and he was pronounced dead at 6.17 p.m. For my last story, I told the story of former NLPD officer Len Davis, who was sentenced to death for ordering a hit on an innocent woman by the name of Kim Groves. Today's story is on Antoinette Frank, who is also a former NLPD officer and is currently on death row as well. New Orleans, Louisiana has had its ups and downs as a city throughout its history. From civil wars, natural disasters, and being the center of tourism, the one thing that has been difficult for New Orleans to shake has been corruption. There has also been a history of tension because the city wanted to handle its own affairs and the government of the state of Louisiana wanted to control the city. At one point during the 1930s, when Governor Huey P. Long and Mayor T. Sams Walmsley were in office, armed city police officers and state troopers had a face-off at the Orleans Parish Line. Sidney John Bartholomew was mayor of New Orleans from 1986 to 1994. By the time Sidney was in office, government revenue sharing to municipalities had been reduced tremendously. New Orleans was once receiving about $40 million in annual funding from federal and state sources, but that number dwindled to $6 million. Sidney tried to help the city, but its plans made thousands of people lose their jobs. He was not so hands-on with the economic development of the city and wanted the private sector to be the main source of income for the city. At one point, he wanted to privatize public housing and demolish many private housing communities. Although there had been some success with him as a mayor, overall, the city's population continued to decline while the crime rate, murder rate, and drug use statistics continued to rise. Students in public schools were failing, and corruption had gotten so bad in the early 1990s that the FBI interjected themselves to try and help the community with their undercover operations. After one sting called Operation Shattered Shield that started in 1993, the FBI had evidence against a dozen officers who were involved in a protection racket. The New Orleans Police Department Chief, Richard Pennington, worked with the Department of Justice, the FBI, the U.S. Marine Corps, and the Louisiana State Police to improve the city's ethics education for department leaders, but over the years it has been hard for citizens to shake not having trust in authority. Some make the intention of doing well but get caught up in the same cycle of corruption, while others are thugs before receiving their badges and remain thugs after they obtain it. Born on April 30, 1971, Antoinette Frank grew up in the rough areas of New Orleans, Louisiana. She came from a broken home with her father, Adam Frank, coming in and out of her life at random times and a brother who grew up to become a fugitive. Antoinette grew up physically and mentally taken advantage of and struggled with mental health issues but kept them to herself. 
Despite her personal struggles, family struggles, and bad environment, she claimed that her dream was always to become a police officer. In June of 1992, Antoinette moved into a small house with her father, Adam, but in August of 1993, she said that he went missing again. He was never a constant in her life, so it was not abnormal for him to be gone, but that was the last time anyone had ever heard from him. That same year, Antoinette fought to make her dreams come true when she applied to the New Orleans Police Department. Antoinette was a young 22-year-old when she applied, but she lied on her application when it came to her mental health. One psychiatrist who examined her by the name of Philip Scuria said that she was shallow and superficial and should not be hired under any circumstances. Antoinette was still very determined to become an officer, and during this time, the NLPD lost many officers due to corruption, so they were in need of fresh officers. Antoinette ended up reapplying, and she was finally able to fulfill her dreams of wearing a badge. The NLPD doesn't and didn't hire any officers who did not live in New Orleans, and Antoinette did, so she was officially hired on February 7, 1993, and graduated from the police academy on February 28, 1993. On November 25, 1994, Antoinette responded to a shooting incident involving a drug dealer by the name of Rogers Lacaze. For some reason, Antoinette grew fond of Rogers and they continued to communicate and socialize despite what he did for a living and the circumstances under which they met. Rogers grew sick from lead poisoning at one point and Antoinette took care of him. Antoinette's fellow officers later testified that they witnessed her driving Rogers around in her police vehicle while she was on duty at the scene of an accident she was supposed to be investigating. On another occasion, she allowed Rogers to accompany her on a complaint call and introduced Rogers as her trainee. Sometimes she would even claim that Rogers was her nephew, but anytime anyone decided to press the seriousness of their relationship, Antoinette would just respond by saying she was trying to help him out. In actuality, Antoinette did not feel like Rogers was a relative at all, and the two started a sexual relationship. They would engage in sexual intercourse in the back of her cruiser in alleys or sketchy areas. Sometimes these areas were where Rogers would be selling crack. With sex came love, and Antoinette fell for Rogers quick. She had been asked at a later date why she continued talking to Rogers when she knew of his criminal history, but she said that she was able to dissociate herself from him in his past. On February 4th, 1995, Rogers attended a party with two attendees of the party being John Stevens and Anthony Wallace. Rogers was having a verbal altercation with John Stevens, so Anthony Wallace suggested that Rogers leave the party. After Rogers left the party, Anthony and John ended up leaving the party as well and drove a couple of blocks away from where the party was being held. After a short while, Anthony and John were pulled over by a police car. Out of the vehicle comes Antoinette Frank, who was in her police uniform. She instructed the men to get out of the car and stand in front of the trunk area. Anthony said that he noticed Rogers was also there and had a weapon, so he rushed Rogers. Anthony and Rogers began fighting, and then John jumped in. After John got in on the fight, Antoinette joined as well. Next thing you know, a gun goes off and John starts running away. A bystander by the name of Irvin Bryant, who also happened to be a civil sheriff, grabbed Anthony and Rogers, breaking up their fight. Right before Irvin was able to grab Anthony, Anthony had picked up a Tech-9 semi-automatic gun out of the grass. He demanded Anthony drop the gun and Anthony listened right away. Irvin thought he was helping a good cop so when Antoinette told him that Rogers was the good guy and instructed him to release Rogers, he listened. She said that the other two were the ones who were causing problems. Irvin let go of Rogers and continued to hold Anthony down until backup came. Anthony Wallace was eventually arrested and charged with attempted murder and armed robbery, while Rogers was never questioned by police and never gave a formal statement. While Antoinette was busy building up her corrupt credentials, she was also working part-time as a security officer for a Vietnamese restaurant called Kim An. The Vu's were a kind family that ran the restaurant. Their children Quang, Ha, and Chow loved Antoinette. The whole family showered Antoinette with gifts, and anytime she asked for something, 
the Vus had no issues giving it to her. On March 4, 1995, Antoinette and Rogers went to Kim Ahn's twice that night to eat some free leftover food. Chow was working that night with her siblings, and she let Antoinette and Rogers out, but she was unable to find the front door key. Working as security that night was Antoinette's old partner, Officer Ronald Williams II. It was getting late, and it was slow, so the Vus were getting ready to lock up and call it a night. Chow was still unable to find the front door key, but still decided to pay Officer Williams and let him leave for the night. She walked back to the kitchen to count the money, and then entered the dining room to hand Officer Williams the money. She then noticed Antoinette and Rogers returning for the third time. Chow's instincts told her that something was not right, so she ran back to the kitchen and hid the money she had in the microwave. The reason why Chow was unable to find the key to the restaurant was because it was none other than Antoinette who had stolen it. With the stolen key, Antoinette unlocked the front door and walked right in with Rogers. They walked past Officer Williams and pushed Chow, her brother Kwok, and another employee into the doorway of the restaurant's kitchen. Officer Williams felt uneasy and followed the couple asking them what they were doing. As soon as Officer Williams addressed the situation, shots were fired. Antoinette went back into the dining room and this gave Chow and Kwok enough time to hide inside of the rear walk-in cooler that was located in the kitchen. The shots that were fired came from Rogers. When Antoinette had walked the employees to the hallway, Rogers had stayed behind in the dining room, so when Officer Williams walked closer to Antoinette, it left Rogers behind Officer Williams. Rogers shot Officer Williams from the back, and it instantly paralyzed him. Rogers shot him two more times, and Officer Williams died right then and there. As mentioned before, Chow and Kwok were able to hide in the walk-in cooler, and they turned off the lights in the kitchen before heading there. Unfortunately, their siblings Ha and Kwong were in the dining room sweeping when Antoinette and Rogers walked in. Antoinette began looking in areas where the Vus usually kept their money, but could not find anything. The couple yelled and demanded to be shown where the money was, but Ha and Kwong did not know where Chow hid the money. Kwong was pistol whipped and shot six times. Ha was shot three times. Both died at the scene of the crime while Antoinette and Rogers left empty-handed. Kwok left the restaurant after the couple left, ran to a nearby friend's house, and called 911. Chow tried calling 911 on her cell phone during the murders, but she had no service in the cooler. Antoinette and Rogers were now on the run. Antoinette dropped Rogers off at an apartment complex nearby, and being that she was a police officer, she had her scanner on, and was able to hear the 911 call on her portable police radio stating that an officer was down at the Kim On restaurant. Antoinette drove back to the restaurant, but this time parked in the back and then entered through the back door of the restaurant. Antoinette then walked through the kitchen to the dining room where she saw Chow waiting by the front door for help to arrive. When Chow noticed Antoinette, she ran out of the front door towards the arriving officers. Antoinette followed and identified herself as a police officer. Antoinette then asked Chow, are you all right? Chow responded in broken English, why would you ask that? You were there. You knew it happened. That was enough for NLPD homicide detective Eddie Rance to start questioning Antoinette. Detective Rance had Chow and Antoinette enter the restaurant and they were both questioned at different tables. Detective Rance said at a later date that there was no doubt in his mind that Antoinette returned to the restaurant to kill the remaining witnesses. After being interrogated at the restaurant, she was taken into the police headquarters for further questioning. After being interrogated for a while, Antoinette confessed and ratted on Rogers in the process. Rogers was apprehended and they were both arrested and charged with first-degree murder. They were both indicted by an Orleans Parish grand jury on April 28, 1995, but they were tried separately. Rogers was tried from July 17 through the 21st, 1995, and he was found guilty and sentenced to death. Antoinette's trial began on September 5, 1995. Although her defense subpoenaed 40 witnesses, there was substantial evidence against Antoinette, and they did little to come up with a strong defense. Antoinette was found guilty on September 12, 1995, and she was sentenced to death on October 20, 1995. 
A month after she was sentenced, a dog had dug up bones where Antoinette used to live. Police were led to a human skull that had parts missing, but they did notice a bullet hole in the skull. Many thought the remains belonged to Antoinette's father and that she was behind his disappearance. To date, though, not much has been done to identify the John Doe. On October 18, 2006, now represented by new attorneys, they argued that Antoinette's death sentence should be overturned because she was denied state-funded experts to help prepare for the sentencing phase of the trial. On May 22, 2007, the Louisiana Supreme Court ruled that the death penalty should be upheld. On April 22, 2008, Judge Frank Murillo signed the death warrant for Antoinette, and her execution date by method of lethal injection was scheduled for July 15, 2008. When May came around, the Louisiana Supreme Court issued a 90-day stay of execution pending ongoing appeals. After her 90-day stay was over, a second death warrant was signed by the same judge. On November 25, 2008, the Louisiana State Supreme Court made the decision to cancel the death warrant signed by Judge Murillo again due to ongoing appeals. Antoinette fought for Judge Murillo to be taken off of her case because he had signed her death warrant twice. At first, her request was denied, but in 2010, it was ruled that Judge Murillo had to be recused from the case because it was unclear if he had been open with the defense teams about his own connection to the gun used in the restaurant murders. Antoinette is currently one of two women on Louisiana's death row at the St. Gabriel Louisiana Correctional Institute for Women. Rogers claims that he is as innocent as the victims who died that unfortunate night, but he is also on death row, but in Angola, and while on death row, he received a short letter from Antoinette that read, Stick to your innocence. I'm proud of you. God keep you. In a quote from Murderpedia, Initially, the Vu family's restaurant in New Orleans East remained opened at the site of the tragedy. Hurricane Katrina damaged the restaurant in 2005, and post-storm looters stole jewelry which Ha and Kwong had been wearing when they were killed. After that, Kwok and his mother sold the old location and reopened in a new city where they felt much safer. And now for a discussion and question time. If you lived in a city where a cop is behind the murder of your family, and a majority of the officers in the precinct are corrupt, do you think that you would feel more safe having people in the community handle your affairs? Is that why some say snitches get stitches? Is that the reason for having street code? Wouldn't it be a never-ending cycle of the same things and the same negative feelings towards the people who are supposed to protect and make you feel safe? Living in a city that has always made its people feel unsafe? What do you think needs to happen in order for those people to feel safe again, to have trust again? Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Today's sentence to death episode is on Kenneth Eugene Barrett, whose sentence was just overturned this year in 2021. Kenneth Barrett was born in 1962 and did not have the best childhood. He had to grow up very fast and began hanging around the wrong crowds fairly early. His first run-in with the law happened when he was around 18 years old, and he got into a physical fight with Sequoia County Sheriff Johnny Philpot. Sheriff Johnny was able to win the struggle by punching Kenneth in the face, which caused his jaw to break. Kenneth was hospitalized for mental illnesses in 1986, 1994, and 1995, and was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, PTSD, and depression by a Dr. Woods. Dr. Woods also documented that Kenneth had generational history of mood disorders, depression, and reactive violence. He was prescribed antipsychotic medications, but he used street drugs along with his prescriptions, which was not good for him. In January of 1999, the District Court of Sequoia in the state of Oklahoma had a warrant out for Kenneth for failure to appear for jury trial and for charges of the unlawful delivery of controlled substances. Kenneth was heavily involved in the making and distribution of meth in his home, and although many had their eyes on him, he was able to avoid being arrested for months. It wasn't until September of 1999 when the District 27 Drug Task Force received a tip from an informant. The supervising agent by the name of Clint Johnson was told by the informant that Kenneth said he promised to kill any officer who came to arrest him. Kenneth also started dealing at night because he believed that the law would not be able to follow through with a search warrant at night. 
With that information, Clint Johnson prepared paperwork for a search warrant that was ultimately approved. The search warrant allowed the task force to follow through with their search at any time, which included nighttime, and it also did not require them to knock or announce their presence due to the quote-unquote violent and unstable nature of Kenneth. They also had no idea how many people would be inside the home, but they did know that Kenneth owned firearms, and with him threatening the lives of police officers, they had to be prepared. Clint got in touch with the Oklahoma Highway Patrol tactical team because Kenneth's home was only accessible by going through a dead-end road, and he had relatives that lived in homes nearby. The TAC team was experienced with high-risk search warrants, so they were prepared to help. On September 23, 1999, the TAC team spent hours surveilling Kenneth's home in a white, unmarked Ford Bronco. In Kenneth's home that day was his cousin, who brought the car to his attention, but Kenneth said that he knew it was law enforcement and would go out in a blaze of glory and did not care. After surveilling the home, they came up with a plan and wanted to execute it that same night. The front gate to Kenneth's property was locked, so they decided to bring two unmarked vehicles and one marked highway patrol vehicle with two law enforcement officers in each car. The vehicles were going to go on a private driveway and drive through a ditch onto Kenneth's property, and they would walk on foot the rest of the way to Kenneth's house and go inside through the front door. A fourth vehicle, which would be a marked highway patrol car, was going to station right outside of the locked gate, and the officers in that fourth vehicle were going to climb the fence and provide cover. A fifth vehicle, which was another unmarked Ford Bronco, would park in the driveway of Kenneth's mother's house. It was now 12.30 in the morning on September 24, 1999, and the TAC team was now ready to follow through with their plan. The five vehicles headed towards Kenneth's property. Some officers climbed the fence to enter Kenneth's property, while the other unmarked vehicles took the other route with the first vehicle having their lights off. The officers that scaled the fence made it closest to the house first, and saw Kenneth's son Toby outside and immediately apprehended him. While being put in cuffs, Toby yelled out for his dad. Now aware of the fact that law enforcement was on his property, Kenneth grabbed his firearms and began shooting towards the vehicles. In the first vehicle was Officer Hamilton and Officer David Eels. Their vehicle was rattled with bullets and Officer Hamilton was struck in the face from bullet fragments. They were unable to turn on their lights for a clear view because of the car being severely damaged, so the second vehicle drove a bit closer with their emergency lights on, which lit up Kenneth's residence. Officer Hamilton, injured and not returning fire, hid by laying down on the vehicle's front seats, and Officer Eels got out of the vehicle on the driver's side. He attempted to make it to the back of his vehicle and in front of the vehicle behind him, but Kenneth was able to shoot him three times. Officer Hamilton noticed that his partner had been struck, so in order to divert Kenneth's attention, he threw a device out of the driver's side window that caused a flash bang. The distraction worked and Kenneth stopped firing momentarily. Officer Hamilton then got out of the vehicle in an attempt to find his partner, but once out of the vehicle, he was shot in the left shoulder by Kenneth. Injured and on the ground, he noticed his partner Officer Eels unresponsive and face down in the ground. Another officer, Officer Mannion, came to assist, which allowed Hamilton to see where the shots were coming from. He noticed Kenneth in the doorway of his house holding a rifle, so he fired two rounds at Kenneth, but every shot missed. Officer Mannion then left from behind the first unmarked vehicle where he attempted to help Officer Eels and snuck to the side of Kenneth's house and fired two shots through a window that was facing the doorway. Kenneth was struck in the leg and other lower extremities, but was still alive. He fell to the ground and was approached by Officer Hamilton, who instructed Kenneth to get up, in which Kenneth responded that he wasn't able to because he was shot. Three officers then dragged Kenneth's body from the house to the front yard, put him in handcuffs, and proceeded to search his property. Although no one else was home, the TAC team was able to find materials used for Kenneth's meth production weapons, and over $2,000 in cash. Kenneth had fired around 20 shots at the TAC team, and the three that hit Officer Eels landed in his chest, the left side of his abdomen, and his right arm. The team was unable to provide assistance during the shooting, so the ambulance arrived late, and once at the hospital, Officer Eels was pronounced dead. Because of who Kenneth killed, it was considered a federal crime, 
and because of the 1994 Federal Death Penalty Act enacted by Congress in 1994 that stated that if a defendant is convicted of a federal capital offense, the government can petition the court to have a separate sentencing phase, and the government chose to do just that. Kenneth was initially charged with first-degree murder and three counts of shooting with intent to kill on September 24, 1999, but it changed to one count of shooting with intent to kill and two counts of discharging his firearm with intent to kill. Although charged in 1999, his trial did not start until late 2002 and there was a hung jury on October 19, 2002. The retrial began a couple of years later in the beginning of 2004 and the jury did not feel as if Kenneth intentionally killed Officer Eels. They rejected the charge of murder and he was acquitted of the intent to kill charges and they believed it was first degree manslaughter and assault with a dangerous weapon. He received his sentence on April 19, 2004 and was sentenced to 20 years in prison for manslaughter and 10 for the assault and battery convictions and they were to be served consecutively which would make it a total of 30 years in prison. Kenneth had no intentions of appealing this sentence and was fine with the judgment. Towards the end of 2005 though, his federal case began because the Eastern District of Oklahoma charged him with eight different counts. He was charged with intent to kill a law enforcement officer in the performance of the state law enforcement officer's official duties and for carrying a firearm during and in relation to drug trafficking offenses, which also resulted in death. In less than a month after trial began, Kenneth was found guilty by a jury on November 4, 2005, and they believed, with his threats, he intentionally killed and knew he was going to do so all along. With his death sentence came automatic appeals and many points argued in order to try and get his sentence overturned. One point was that one of the jurors should have been dismissed because during a lunch break, he had a conversation with one of the officers who was also a witness. While talking, the juror realized that he knew one of the officer's family members, but the juror later testified that they did not discuss the case at all, and the court believed the testimony. Another point for the appeal was that there was no evidence to warrant a judge approving a no-knock, any time of day search warrant, and that his crime was not premeditated. This was the response. Mr. Barrett had been aware for some time of the outstanding warrant for his arrest, and anticipated the law enforcement officials would come to his house to arrest him at some point. Despite that awareness, or perhaps because of it, Mr. Barrett exhibited a defiant attitude towards law enforcement officials. On the front gate leading to his residence, Mr. Barrett had installed a sign reading, keep out, I don't give a who you are. If you cross my gate or come on my property, I'll shoot. Further, in the months and weeks leading up to the date of the shooting, Mr. Barrett regularly told friends and family that if law enforcement officers came to his house, there was going to be a shootout, he would shoot the first police that came through his door, and he was going to take out as many law enforcement officers as he could before they got him. Indeed, on the evening of the shooting, Mr. Barrett observed three of the TAC team members drive by his residence in an unmarked vehicle and subsequently stated to his cousin, Travis Crawford, that he knew the vehicles belonged to law enforcement officials that he didn't give a f if they came to serve the arrest warrant and that he was going to go out in a blaze of glory if they did so. Mr. Barrett's conduct in the months, weeks, and days leading up to the shooting incident suggests his threats were far from idle. Mr. Barrett possessed multiple firearms at his residence, including five rifles, three shotguns, and two pistols. During the day, Mr. Barrett typically kept a rifle nearby. He also carried a 9mm pistol in his pants at all times. As for the night of the shooting incident, the evidence presented at trial was more than sufficient to have allowed the jury to reasonably find that Mr. Barrett knew it was law enforcement officials who were approaching his residence en masse. In 2015, however, the 10th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ordered that a new hearing be held in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Oklahoma to determine whether or not Kenneth had sufficient legal representation. A magistrate determined that he did not have sufficient legal representation, and in 2019, a federal judge agreed with the magistrate's decision. Given Mr. Barrett's recollections of childhood and adult head injuries, his performance on tests, and the records of at least some head injuries, 
the jury could reasonably have concluded Mr. Barrett suffered from brain damage. The death sentence was overturned, but the two life sentences remained for his weapon charges. His federal death sentence was being carried out at the U.S. Penn in Terre Haute, Indiana, while awaiting his new sentencing hearing. On January 19, 2021, the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit was able to read over all of the evidence left out of the initial trial, and they reversed the district court's decision of finding no prejudice, and the circuit judge ended by saying, I lack confidence that the outcome would have been the same had this mitigation evidence been presented to the jury. The experts were well credentialed, there was supporting evidence, and their examination of Mr. Barrett was apparently more extensive than those conducted in the past. The damage to Mr. Barrett's reasoning capacity may have been responsible for his plan to go down in flames. And there is a difference between blustering about having a shootout with police and actually deciding to go through with it. So impairment of his judgment during the raid may have been ultimately responsible for his deadly actions. A reasonable juror might well have decided that the mitigating evidence precluded a death sentence. In that regard, I note that the state jury did not find Mr. Barrett guilty of first-degree murder, and the federal jury imposed the death penalty on only one of the three death-eligible offenses. Kenneth is still in prison while awaiting for a new sentencing hearing.